pleasure today to introduce Dr. Maggie Dwiggins. Dr. Dwiggins attended medical school at the University of Illinois in Rockford with a special emphasis on rural medicine. She then completed her residency in OBGYN at the University of Illinois in Peoria and pursued a fellowship in pediatric and adolescent gynecology at MedStar Georgetown and Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC. After completing her fellowship, she joined us here at Norton Healthcare and is my partner in the Norton Children's Gynecology Practice. Dr. Dwiggins has experience in a broad range of complaints in pediatric and adolescent gynecology, but she has a special interest in oncofertility and fertility pr preservation, as well as congenital anomalies of the reproductive tract. Um, she is among the leadership for the Pediatric Initiative Network of the Oncofertility Consortium and co-chairs the research subcommittee there. She also has brought the database for this organization to Norton Healthcare and the Norton Cancer Institute. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dwickens, who is going to speak to us today on what's new in contraception. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Hertwick. Um, let me really quickly share my screen here. Okay, so um, like Dr. Hertwick said, this presentation is going to be brief um, and it will touch on what's new in contraception as well as focus on a lot of the questions that I get from pediatricians here in the area. Um, so just kind of use this as a way to answer some common questions and then just kind of tell you what's new. So I have no disclosures. Um, and here are the three main objectives that I'd like for you to have by the end of, of the presentation. Um, so first, understand the safety and efficacy of contraception for the adolescent patient. Then review how contraceptives are used for non-contraceptive complaints. And then also acknowledge some of these special considerations when we talk about contraception. So to start out this presentation, uh, I would like to do a little case for you and poll the audience to see what you guys think. Um, so I don't know, Karen, if this is the time, but uh, yep, there we go. So this is the question. You see in your office a 13-year-old sexually active female. So she had coitarchy six months ago, and in the past six months, she has had five new partners. She says she never uses condoms. Um, of note, menarche was age 11 and she has regular monthly menses. She has no other past medical history at all. Her BMI is normal at 23. Her blood pressure is also normal, 110 over 60. And so in your opinion, which of these options is the least appropriate to offer her or to counsel her about? I'll give you guys a few seconds or maybe a minute here to look that over and respond. I also want to take this moment to apologize if you hear your baby crying in the background. We will try to keep him as quiet as possible. <laughs> Anybody, it looks like 15 people have um, put in their thoughts. Anybody else want to give it a go before I close this? Okay. Well, we will revisit this question at the end of the case and we'll see how everybody did. 
Okay, so um, I also just, I know we're gonna have a menstrual abnormalities talk too, but just for my presentation, just keep in mind the menstrual cycle as a vital sign. Um, so since 2015, the Adolescent Committee of ACOG actually uh, put out a bulletin about the menstrual cycle as a vital sign, just to remind us that when we see patients, we are taking temperature, blood pressure, pulse, asking about um, sleep and food and stuff like that, but we also need to be asking about the menstrual cycle. Um, so the average age of menarche is nine to 15. Uh, the average cycle length for the adolescent is every 21 to 45 days from start to start. Um, this is a little bit different than the adults. Uh, an adult should not have more than 35 days between cycle, but again, uh, in an adolescent, 21 to 45 days might be normal. Um, when you see somebody who has more than 90 days between uh, periods, then that could be a sign of something abnormal that needs to be evaluated. So again, cycle length should be anywhere from three to seven days. Um, <clears throat> the average is in the adolescent can be about five to seven days. So again, if, you're, if the cycle length is fewer than three days or longer than seven days, again, needs to be evaluated. Um, and then the flow, ask the patients, uh, oops, sorry. Ask patients um, how many pads or tampons they're going through in a day. And if there's more than eight pads and that also needs further evaluation. Uh, so the reason that I bring this up though is because patients will come to us and say they need contraception and we don't want to be missing something that we need to look into. So always ask about periods, make sure that they're regular, make sure you've worked them up first before we offer any sort of contraception or hormones that would change the cycle in some way. And so just to, again, really briefly, this is a slide to show why abnormalities may require evaluation. Um, so you can, you can see those here. I know you can have a, a PowerPoint too, or you, you have a PDF as well. Um, so we'll talk about this in later presentations. All right, <clears throat> so when talking about contraception, the absolute best contraception to offer a patient is the contraception that the patient will, will actually use. And so there was the CHOICE project that was out of St. Louis um, and it looked at adults and at adolescents. And that's what you can see here on the left side of the screen. So what they looked at was initiation and use of contraception, continued use of contraception. So at one year, you can see that the LARCs, so the IUDs, the Nexplanons, were by far uh, the ones that the patients were still using. And so the copper IUD, 100% or 88% of people were still using, sorry, I said that wrong. The hormonal IUD, the levonorgestrel IUD, 88% of patients were still using at one year. The copper IUD, 84%, and the implant in the arm, the etonogestrel implant, 83%. And then when we talk about the less invasive non-LARCs, um, Depo-Provera was next in line. So 57% of patients were still using uh, pills, 55% of patients were still using, so really close to the Depo shot. And then the vaginal ring and the patch, again, 49, 54 and 49% of patients were still using at one year. Um, so while the LARCs were obviously had a, a better use, we also wanted to see if the patients were satisfied when using these methods. So the second part of that screen is satisfaction at one year. And it's really interesting to see that satisfaction really correlates with continued use. And so those who are using the IUDs, the LARCs, had the same satisfaction as they were still using. Clearly they probably would have changed methods. And then again, um, the satisfaction for the non-LARC options was about the same. Uh, this study also then started to look at the adolescent and the adolescent satisfaction and still using, and they saw very, very similar re results for those. Um, so again, the adolescent was more satisfied and had continuous use of the LARC over the shot or the pills. So what they concluded from this trial and what ACOG has said was that LARCs should still be considered first line 
um, contraceptive choices in teens and adolescents as well. <clears throat> so then to talk about contraception and pregnancy. Um, unintended pregnancies are huge for the, for the adolescent population. So of the teens who become pregnant in high school, only about half of them will graduate from high school or get a GED. And of those half that have a high school degree, half still live below poverty. And so if there is a strong risk of pregnancy, we do want to address that because we want to give these, these kids the best chance of success as possible. So what this graph is showing is the rates of unintended pregnancy uh, based on use of contraception. So the patients who use contraception consistently or have perfect use, the rate of unintended pregnancy is only 5%. That's pretty good. Now, most of our teens will use contraception inconsistently, um, especially if it's the pill, the patch, the ring or depo. And so the rate of unintended pregnancy in that group is 41%. But in those who do not use any hormonal contraception, the rate of unintended pregnancy is 54%. So your patient has a one in two chance of becoming pregnant unintentionally um, without contraception. So really it is important to think about using contraception in this patient population, even if they come to you very, very young. <clears throat> Um, and now this is another question that I get a lot is about the safety of contraceptives. And um, I just wanted to include this slide to show that pregnancy is risky. And you can see all of these adverse events that are directly associated with pregnancy. And some of these adverse events are more likely in the adolescent. So severe Hypertension or preeclampsia is more common in the adolescent. Um, you have poor weight gain and you have <clears throat> uh, fetal mortality as well in the adolescent. And so even though there is risks of contraception, um, the risk of pregnancies definitely outweigh the risk of contraceptive use. Okay. And now this is another slide just kind of showing why adolescents use contraception in the United States. And um, so any non-contraceptive reason is the most common reason for using contraception in the adolescent. And I'll talk about the ways that we use contraception uh, for other conditions outside of birth control in the upcoming slides here but 58% of the adolescents will actually use birth control for non-birth control reasons. And the vast minority of them, only 14% of them are using uh, the, the contraception for birth control alone. <laughs> All right, and now this slide, I hope everybody knows about this. It is the CDC medical eligibility criteria or the CDC MEC. And so this is um, an app that you can download on your phone, which is great, and it is free. This is how you, you search for it and find it. Uh, but what this is, is you can search for uh, comorbidities or uh, patient past medical history and see what kind of birth control is the most appropriate, what kind of birth control is the least appropriate, and some of the adverse events to look out for. And this is what it looks like. Um, there's also, like graphs that you can print out too. And what you can see is the condition all the way on the left, and then several conditions will have subconditions as well. So as you can see that first one, anatomic abnormalities, uh, you have a distorted uterine cavity versus other abnormalities. Um, and that's important because then when you keep going across the screen, they have broken down the different types of birth controls that we have. And so the first one is the combined hormonal contraceptive pill, the one that contains estrogen. Uh, following that is the progesterone only pill. And then next is the Depo-Provera or the medroxyprogesterone uh, injection. Following that is the implant. And they're talking about the etonorgestrel implant, the next planon. And then you have the levonorgestrel releasing IUD. And then finally the copper IUD. And so what you would do 
with this information is you see anatomic abnormalities, you have a distorted uterine cavity, like a bicone uterus, septate uterus, something like that. And what you see is that only IUDs are contraindicated. So level one is um, no known risk. Level four is risks outweigh the benefits. And now as you go along here, you also see some twos and some threes. And so when we say something is category two, what we're saying is that there could be some adverse events, but the risk of pregnancy outweighs the possible adverse events of the birth control pill. And so still, if it's category two, recommend that use if that's what the patient wants and if that's what the patient will continue to use. Um, the category three is probably you should think about using something different um, because the risks of the birth control may outweigh the benefits from um, the contraceptive protection. Uh, again, though, with proper patient counseling, if the category three is the only thing that the patient's able to use, then it still might be a safe, safe option. Again, category four, I would probably never use in the patients. So yeah, so this is just a brief summary of the CDC MEC. Uh, we'll use it again at the end of the presentation, but I would strongly encourage anybody who prescribes birth control to use this. Oh. <clears throat> So for dysmenorrhea, this is probably one of the most common complaints and one of the most common things that we see. Uh, we'll have a whole presentation about it, so I'm just going to touch really briefly. Um, but we start with uh, NSAIDs, non-steroidals, as first-line treatment for dysmenorrhea. But if they're really, if NSAIDs are not controlling pain very well, or if the patient is very, very bothered, then we typically offer some sort of hormonal contraception. And for these patients on just birth control pills alone, 90% of users will have improvements by the three month mark, but that still leaves patients who are, have no improvement or patients that have had improvement, but are still suffering from dysmenorrhea and still um, impacting their quality of life. And so really the options for these patients would probably be menstrual suppression. If they've failed cyclic use, then menstrual suppression would be the next use. And as you can see here, uh, there are several options for menstrual suppression just to treat dysmenorrhea. And so one of the easier things to do would be continuous um, OCP use, so continuous combined hormonal contraceptives. And what the patients do is I instruct them just to pop out the last week of pills, or placebo anyway, throw them away, and then start the next pack immediately. So every time they pick up a new prescription, just the first thing they do is pop out the pills so that they know that, the, that they're not supposed to take them. Uh, another really easy option is progesterone-only pills. These are designed to stop periods, but they're not perfect. And so um, with either continuous hormonal contraceptives or the birth control progesterone, the norethen drone, um, the risk of breakthrough bleeding is between 40 and 60%. So 40 to 60% of patients will still have breakthrough bleeding. If this occurs, then we usually take a pill break just to let the lining of the uterus shed um, and just to kind of reset things. Uh, with the non-hormonal norethindrone acetate use, the breakthrough bleeding is, is a little bit less, but again, this is not a contraceptive use. So agestin is not a, a contraceptive. And then for the patients who want really good contraception as well as some really good um, menstrual suppression, we have the LARC options. So the next plan on is a fantastic option for these adolescents, um, easy to place. It's a same day procedure, Oops, sorry. Easy to place, same day procedure, um, but the rate of, of breakthrough bleeding is nearly 90%. So only 10%, 10 to 20% of patients will have menstrual suppression with the next one on alone. So if a patient comes to me with dysmenorrhea, I almost always start them on a progesterone only pill concurrently with the next one on for menstrual suppression. And then there's the IUD. The IUD is probably our most effective form of menstrual suppression. It's also a fantastic contraceptive. Um, and so I offer this too as patients just to treat their dysmenorrhea if that's what they desire. <clears throat> okay, and so acne, uh, we have several patients too who come to us 
uh, about acne and what we can do to help them. And so a lot of times I will start these patients again on a combined oral contraceptive pill. So what estrogen does is the estradiol of these pills inhibits the androgen production from the ovaries. And this then increases sex hormone binding globulin production. Uh, and this kind of then blocks the effects of testosterone blocks at the level of the skin. And so the sebaceous glands, that action is inhibited, free androgens are reduced, and that can over time can really help the, the acne in patients. Um, it does take time. So about three to six months before they will notice any improvement. Sorry, I don't know why these are going by like this. <clears throat> So I always tell my patients that they have to give it time. Any oral contraceptive pill kind of works the same as any other contraceptive pill. Yasmin and Yaz are the only FDA approved estrogen containing pills to treat acne, but really any estradiol is, works well. And now we have a new progesterone only pill, which is SLIND. So SLIND is drosperinone only, and it is now FDA approved for, the, for acne as well. Um, of note about SLIND is it is a little bit more expensive currently, but they have good discount programs. And also there is a built-in four-day placebo at the end of SLIND, unlike with the other norethindrone progesterone-only pills. Uh, SLIND is designed to have four-day pill break, and you might have some breakthrough bleeding there, which is, com which is normal. That would be expected. But just make sure that your patients know this. It's not going to uh, provide menstrual suppression. And then we have endometriosis. Um, so as you know, endometriosis can only be diagnosed via surgery, um, but there are some red flags in a patient's history that would lead me to believe that they might have endometriosis. So something like family history, if a mother or sister has endometriosis, the patient is seven times more likely to also have it. Um, if they have um, pain outside of cycles too, and if they've failed other treatment, then I really do think of endometriosis. <clears throat> so when I do suspect endometriosis, or if I have diagnosed it, the goal of treatment is ovarian suppression. So again, you as uh, the pediatricians, the first line providers can suspect endometriosis and just start one of these methods. So the gold standard of treatment would be menstrual suppression, ovarian suppression. You can start them with continuous oral contraceptive pills. Again, um, I don't think I've said this before, but I would recommend at least a 30 to 35 microgram estradiol pill, uh, specifically for bone health in these patients. Um, so, and, and the lower doses may not work quite as well. So a continuous OCP 30, 35 microgram, again, the way that I described it before. And then here we get into the Depo Provera. So Depo is a great resource for ovarian suppression. Um, and it's a little bit longer, I don't know what's happening here, uh, a little bit longer use, so it's every three month injection. But there are some uh, side effects of Depo that we need to talk to patients about. Um, first of all is irregular breakthrough bleeding. It's more common in the first three to nine months. After that, uh, menstrual suppression is more common, um, but the patients may initially experience some really profound breakthrough bleeding. Also weight gain, Depo is the only contraception that is associated with weight gain. It's about 10 pounds per year. All the other methods do not have uh, weight gain as a direct correlation. So then just again, uh, if this is what the patient wants, then I say, that's fine, we can use it, uh, but just know that there are some side effects. And then I talked about Agestin before. This progesterone only pill is fantastic for endometriosis. I like it because you can start with five milligrams and titrate up if you need to. Um, just be aware that norethindrone acetate does convert into estradiol a little bit. So at 20 microgram or milligrams of Agestin, the patient is receiving as much estradiol due to peripheral conversion as they would from a 30 microgram estrogen pill. Um, so if your patient has a contraindication to estrogen, be hesitant to use Agestin, um, or if you do, maybe just stick with the low five milligram dose. Uh, and again, Agestin is not a birth control. So let your patients know that. And then if you suspect endometriosis, an IUD is always an option. 
mostly because it's a great menstrual suppress suppressing agent. It lasts for a long time and provides contraception. However, the IUD does not suppress the ovaries and our goal of treatment for endometriosis is ovarian suppression. So if we use an IUD, we can try it alone to see if symptoms are well controlled. However, almost always we will add something to it to suppress the ovaries like a, a continuous uh, combined pill, like a Justin or even the Depo-Provera. <clears throat> uh, and then I have this Lupron and Orlissa are only used with biopsy proven endometriosis and they're not contraceptions either. Okay, so now a, a few special contraceptive considerations, uh, high risks of STIs. So those patients who are sex trafficking, homeless, or have recurrent STIs, use caution with the IUD because um, with active cervicitis the, and insertion, the risk of PID is increased, um, but also it's just a foreign body in the cervix. And so we, we want to treat STIs with the use of IUD. We don't want to leave them untreated. Uh, for the obese patient, the transdermal patch has failure has increased failure rate if the ideal body weight is increased. So if there's more than 130% of ideal body weight, uh, the patch does not work as well. But keep in mind that emergency contraception is also less effective with a BMI of greater than 30. It conveys a four-time increased risk of pregnancy. So any contraception is better than no contraception or emergency contraception. For seizures, estrogen is contraindicated. It decreases the seizure thr threshold and makes them more likely. Um, and what has been studied for these patients is depomedroxyprogesterone, the Provera shot, and agestin. And what they have seen with these two methods is that seizure rates do not increase. And with depo, you actually decrease number of seizures in some patients. And then last, if you have an increased risk of blood clots, you cannot use estradiol. Um, but this is where it gets kind of tricky. So the CDC MEC is your friend here. And then other contraceptive considerations that I hear a lot is uh, what about breast cancer? And so the most recent literature states that if there is a risk of breast cancer just by using a birth control alone, that risk is one in a million. And so I, I do feel like that is pretty safe to use. Um, and also if a patient has a family history or a personal history of the BRCA mutations, we actually do recommend birth control use. Uh, and this is for chemo prophylaxis. So meaning that we can suppress the ovaries, decrease the risk of ovarian cancer in these patients uh, with, with use of hormones. And ACOG recommends this as well. And the thought behind this is we, can, we know that birth control pills with long-term use, five to 10 years use, will decrease your risk of ovarian cancer by up to 50, 60%. And there currently is no test for ovarian cancer. There's no screening tool for ovarian cancer where we have a great screening tool for breast cancer. And so um, the risks really... The, the benefits really do outweigh the risks of birth control in these patients. I also get a lot of questions about triphasic birth control pills. There's really no added benefit over monophasic. Um, it doesn't necessarily mimic their natural cycle or anything like that. And because adolescents are who they are, um, they don't use them consistently. So there's, most, there's more breakthrough bleeding when using triphasic pills. Um, so I find that my patients don't, don't typically like these as much um, and have more bleeding. And so I don't prescribe them and I often switch patients to monophasic if they've been on triphasic. Um, and then age, like I said before, all contraceptive methods are safe and effective after menarche. So, ooh. all right, so Karen, do you wanna just show the poll results here real quickly? We'll talk about the case in the last few minutes. So again, so this was the, the question. You have a 13 year old sexually active, multiple partners, um, regular periods, no condom use. So why is the least appropriate out of none, birth control pills, a LARC or depo? Um, the majority of you said none, a few said pills and a few said LARCs too. So the right answer is none. <clears throat> 
Uh, so she clearly is at risk of pregnancy. She's also at risk of STDs. Um, so she needs something, if she desires it, she does need something to prevent a pregnancy. So like I said before, this, the age is not a contraindication to any contraceptives. This is the kind of uh, snapshot of the CDC MEC right here. And as you can see, all of the methods are category one or two. And so the only reason that the, the IUDs and the implant are category two for an adolescent is there is a theoretical risk of expulsion in the nulliparous patient or those who have never had a baby before. Um, but again, that, that rate of expulsion is less than the rate of pregnancy, unattended pregnancy in this, in this patient population. So that's the first consideration. Her age, she's 13, what is appropriate? And as you can see, anything's appropriate. And the next, she is at high risk of STIs. She has had uh, six part or five partners in the past six months. She never uses condoms. And so she has high risk sexual behavior right now. And so what you'd want to do is again, pull up the CDC MEC and see that if she currently has gonorrhea or chlamydia or what looks like a cervicitis, an IUD is contraindicated. And like I said before, it's because the insertion of the IUD will increase the risk of ascending infection and PID. And we never want to give our patients PID. Um, so if, if you do suspect gonorrhea or chlamydia, always, always swab for at the time of insertion. Treat if you think that they, they need to be treated prophylactically. Or what you can do is <clears throat> if it's for dysmenorrhea or something like that, and the patient is reliable, you can test them. And if they're positive, wait six weeks. But what I would recommend is just inserting testing and making sure that they get treatment at the time of insertion. Also, um, IUDs do not need to come out if there is PID. Uh, the recommendation right now is to treat with the IUD in situ and leave it. Hmm. All right, um, and then the next consideration is bone health for the adolescent. So between ages 13 and 21, that's when uh, kids, you probably already know this, kids uh, are developing their bones. That's when bone strength happens. And so we want to do something that's not going to affect their bones. Well, there's been a big concern about the use of Depo-Provera and bone mineral density. And it, we used to think that we should not use Depo beyond two years. However, what we're seeing is that um, bone health returns after two years in the adult patient, some good evidence for the adolescent as well. And those who are more at risk for low bone mineral density are those who have low body mass or low body weight at the beginning of use. So again, um, it's category one or two for the adolescent. So consider use if that's what they want, they're at high risk of pregnancy. Oh, so that kind of concludes my presentation. So again, um, just don't forget to use the menstrual cycle as a vital sign. Uh, don't, if, if there's something abnormal, make sure to look into it before starting some hormones that will also change the periods. But then also contraception safe after menarche. Every method is safe in the adolescent. And when in doubt, use your CDC MEC. All right, I'll take some questions now. Thank you, Maggie. Um, we've got several questions listed. Um, the first question is, what would be the best basic workup for a patient with an irregular menstrual cycle? Okay, I think we're going to talk about this a little bit more in some other presentations. Um, I don't have to share, I'll stop sharing. Um, but if the irregular cycle is too frequent or if the bleeding is too long, I always think of thyroid disease or bleeding disorder. If it is less frequent or very, very light, then I would consider something like PCOS, again, a thyroid disorder. Um, always rule out a pregnancy first for any abnormal bleeding and an infection if they're sexually active. And then the basic, the most basic workup would probably be a CBC, testosterone, TSH would be your like base baseline workup. Um, and then I know we'll talk a little bit more about menstrual abnormalities in another presentation, I'm pretty sure. Um, so that would be like basic CBC, testosterone and thyroid. 
Um, would you mention, Maggie, a few examples of OCPs that are available to treat um, PMS and acne? Yeah, so uh, PMS, that's a good question. There is not good data about birth control actually helping PMS. And so the, the better option is actually an SSRI, like Prozac, the week before a period. Um, but some patients are just so bothered by their period and have such anxiety about the period itself that knowing that it'll stop and knowing that it might be less painful, um, those patients might benefit from a birth control pill, but there's not great data showing that birth control pills will help significantly with PMS. Um, that being said, FDA approved for acne is just Yasmin, Yaz, or Slind, but any of the birth controls should help with acne and PMS if, if it's gonna work. Um, I also tend to use um, Yaz and Yasmin. There is some work on PMDD with the use of Yaz and that may have some cross coverage for PMS. So you could consider that pill as well. We've got another question, um, uh, Maggie, please speak to how you would incorporate the option of abstinence into your patient conversations. In the example of the 13 year old with multiple partners, giving contraceptives doesn't address the issues of sexually transmitted diseases and other physical and psychological implications of the risky behaviors. Yes. Oh, I definitely agree with that. Um, and I didn't talk about condom use, but clearly I always uh, talk about condoms. So when I have a patient in front of me and we're talking about contraception, I always start out by saying the best method for preventing a pregnancy and the best method for preventing infection is abstinence. And so I do tell my patients that at the get-go, um, but you have to also be kind of careful about uh, making your patient feel judged or like you're not going to help her. Uh, because we do want to help in any way that we Did we lose Maggie? It looks like it. We did. I'm gonna continue this on for Maggie for just a minute. Um, I would say that I agree. We need to be very cautious when we see these patients who have peers. Um, sorry, my connection looks like it's unstable. But also just to reiterate that she is worth it, that the adolescent, she is worth it to say no. She is worth it to use a condom every single time. And her partner, her teenage partner is not worth it. You know, the teenage partner, it is, is not worth it. If he says, oh, I don't want to use a condom today, then you say, okay, we're not having intercourse today. We're not having sex today because I don't want a pregnancy and I don't want something that's going to affect my fertility. And so I do always have that conversation with the patient as well, um, just to kind of get to know them and get to know what their needs are. Um, but I do often find that if I just talk about abstinence for more than a couple of minutes, then that does turn off the patient. And she might just say, okay, then I'm gonna choose nothing and leave. And that's not the goal of the, of the conversation either. Um, but good question. I did not address that, but very important. We're gonna to have to move on. Um, there is another question about um, calcium supplement with Depo just briefly. We do recommend 1200 milligrams of calcium a day with at least 400 units of vitamin D for these adolescents. And we recommend that you screen them with vitamin D lab testing to make sure that you're adequately supplementing them. Thank you, Dr. Dwiggins. If you